Okay, first of all, uh, I want to apologize uh, for using my phone. I spilled water on my laptop a few days ago. Um, so for now, if I'm looking at this, I'm just looking at my notes. I'm not ignoring you. This is my prelim device for the moment, uh, but hopefully not for much longer. Uh, and I want to thank uh, Naira and Professor uh, Tanilian for organizing so much of this event. This is uh, when they say we co-organized it. It's a huge exaggeration. They did absolutely the majority of the heavy lifting. And also thanks to Jesse, our uh, IT specialist in the back there, who's keeping this running also seamlessly despite the, the problems of hybridity. Um, also, I will say as a grad student, I'm very excited to be at an event with food. Um, for those of us who uh, get much of our sustenance from the leftovers um, from conferences and workshops um, put in the uh, departmental kitchen, there has been an enormous caloric deficit for the past two years. And so <laughs> I'm glad to see that that time is ending. Uh, now, I'll just say a brief word to introduce the topic before I introduce the speakers about nations and nationalism. Um, I have had the privilege of taking a class on that topic with Ron and um, reading many books uh, on it in prelims. Uh, and I'll just say that one of my takeaways from um, Ron's work is that you can't just deal with the, it's not just about the conceptual, analytical, linguistic, political problems of dealing with the nation or thinking about the nation beyond the nation, it's also uh, requires being a public scholar and requires really engaging with public scholarship. And uh, you can see proof of this in Ron's career if you download his CV, which is available on the departmental website, which is, I believe, last time I checked, a modest 101 pages long. And the vast majority of that is op-eds, interviews, public lectures, um, and lots of other things aimed at the public all around the world. Um, and much of it on uh, questions of nationalism and questions of nation. And I think that's been uh, an incredibly important takeaway uh, to really try and engage with your audience because you know we all have a stake in this thing called nation, even if they label you as a traitor, which has happened to Ron, and even if your audience is the CIA who has invited you to give a lecture in their secret headquarters disguised as a bank vault. Um, I don't know if that one made it on the CV. Anyways, okay, so to introduce our, our two uh, esteemed lecture, uh, esteemed um, experts on nationalism as uh, Dr. Olga, uh, Olga Mayorova is an accomplished scholar of Russian literature, intellectual history and nationality uh, in 19th century Russia and is a vital fixture of the Russian Soviet workshop here, I'll say. Uh, her monograph, From the Shadow of Empire, Defining the Russian Nation Through Cultural Mythology, 1855 to the 1870s, is an important resource for both scholars of Russia and of the nation. Uh, and Dr. Krista Goff, who I believe is joining us on Zoom um, from the University of Miami, is a historian of Soviet and post-Soviet history. And like Ron, who she, I believe, worked with here during her PhD at Michigan, an expert in the Caucasus as well. Uh, in her research and teaching, she explores the historical formation of minorities and the experience of minoritization, nationalism, citizenship, empire, ethnic conflict, genocide, and migration. And in addition to all these things, she is co-editor of Critica currently, and also the co-director of the Russian Eastern European and Eurasian Studies think tank based at Howard University. Very interesting. Um, okay, so without further ado, I think we can get started. And Olga, I believe you're slated to go first. Thank you so much. And first of all, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me right. to. First of all, is it, is it better? I, I, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to take part in this wonderful event. But I also want to kind of apologize. The Soviet women, the, the Soviet women began their talks all, always with apologies. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and I should, as, as you probably uh, guessed, I came from a different disciplinary perspective. I was trained as a literary scholar uh, in the Soviet Union. And I focused on Nikolai Liskov, the writer whom it's difficult to read today, even for Russians. Uh, so I spent uh, years um, deciphering uh, and trying to interpret uh, and trying to interpret Liskov. And then, uh, 1991 happened, and since then my research interests changed. I began to think about the role of the nation. Uh, the uh, national questions in the Russian Empire and in the 19th century that I studied. And um, thus I uh, began to write on nationalism or nation nationalities, the national issues in uh, Russia. So 
and another piece of apology, I was not here uh, in, in this country when uh, all the developments, all the academic discussions that you um, recalled and focused on today uh, happened. So I, if I say something wrong, please forgive me in, in, the, in the talk. I will begin to talk about, uh, I, I will begin uh, with talking about uh, Ron's book, The Revenge of uh, the Past, and then I will uh, shift to the article. Uh, the Revenge of the Past is an extraordinary book that, in my view, inaug inaugurated a new era in Russian studies. It has generated a set of new conceptual paradigms, at least for me new, um, but I believe in, it, it was a set of new conceptual paradigms and pro approaches in Russian historiography as a whole and in the field of nationalism and empire in particular. When you read or reread, as I did, uh, The Revenge of the Past Now, almost 30 years after its publication, it's easy to appreciate from, to appreciate what interpretive approaches sprang from this book, approaches um, that remain central to major research agendas today. I will briefly focus on what I consider to be the most important conceptual paradigms that the book opens up, opened up. First of all, this book has argued and beautifully demonstrated that no adequate understanding of the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union is possible if we keep our, our focus solely on Russia proper. Our explanatory, explanatory tools are impaired if we do not take into consideration the role that non-Russian peoples, their nationalisms and their national movements played in Russia's history. Today, this sounds like a critical commonplace to historians of Russia, but in fact, the study of Russia from the perspective of its borderlands or peripheries took on a radically new turn due to the forceful critique of the old approaches that Ron has called Russian bias, biased analyses. Of course, many monographic studies of individual nationalities of the Russian and of the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union existed before the revenge of the past. But they explained the histories of the non-Russian peripheries as sharply di distinguished from histories of central, uh, of central Russia. Ron has demonstrated that without this non-Russian perspective, historians often produce misleading interpretations. They are not able to capture the specific historical contexts and deep contradictions underlying the Russian Soviet empire. Ron's book not only clearly showed the limitations of such Russocentric analysis, but it did much more. It managed to bridge the gap between the research of Russia proper and the study of non-Russian peoples. It demonstrated how and in what respects the center affected the borderlands, and perhaps more importantly, it demonstrated how social and national processes in peripheries affected, sometimes even determined, life in the center. To give an example, before the revenge of the past, before the revenge of the past emerged, if historians of the Russian Revolution studied the developments on the peripheries, they emphasized ethnic rather than social conflicts there. The revenge of the past radically altered this research agenda by uncovering social struggle of great intensity in the non-Russian regions and showing that the social and the ethnic uh, intertwined and often overlapped there. As a result, Ron's book shows the history of revolution and civil war, both in the center and in the periphery, to be, I'm citing Ron again, 
much more related than divorced. Perhaps everyone remembers that the revenge of the past offered an extremely insightful response to the collapse of the Soviet Union, a collapse in which non-Russian nationalities played a profound role by organizing sustained opposition to Gorbachev's perestroika and ultimately undermining the Soviet regime. Thus, the revenge of the past is one of those very rare, rare, rare cases in which historiography of the past immediately explains the present. And the present gives new energy to reinterpreting, reinterpreting the past. Actually, I should confess that I read this book first time still uh, back in, in Russia, and it opened my eyes. Another profound contribution that the revenge of the past made is that it has historicized the problem of nationality formation and offered a comparative perspective on the different histories of the peoples of the Soviet Union. In order to historicize nation building, the book consistently applied to Russia's historiography the understanding of nationalism as a discourse that became dominant among scholars only relatively recently and among pe peoples also only re relatively recently. The book applied to the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union an understanding of nationality as a social and invented construction. These ideas are articulated by Benedict Anderson, Eric Hobsbawm, and many others, uh, are now widely applied to Russia, but this is because the revenge of the past paved the way to this turn towards constructi constru constructivism. Above all, this book has demonstrated that, now I'm citing Ron again, Marxism, the principal, the principal opponent of nationalism, has been empowered by its alliance with nationalism. Moreover, Marxism and the policies introduced by the Bolsheviks have been responsible for creating the conditions for the development of nations. This analysis made it possible for Ron to demonstrate that the complex story of nation building and nationality formation for many peoples of the empire belongs to the Soviet period. Ron traces how and why the Bolsheviks' thinking of the national question altered after the revolution, how the need for alliance with non-Russians and the um, weakness of the central state made it critically important for Lenin to support movements for autonomy and the right for national self-determination. Ron's analysis of this shift in the Bolsheviks' agenda has become, parad has become paradigmatic in the field. In the most general terms, it showed that the state building and nation making were closely connected in the Soviet Russia, in Soviet Russia, and that the early Soviet period saw the consolidation of ethnicity rather than uh, its disappearance. As Ron himself beautifully characterized this dynamic, rather than a melting pot the Soviet Union became an incubator of new nations. This finding radically altered the traditional understanding of the Soviet Union here and in, the, in Russia. Many scholars followed Ron's lead to uncover pre, previously obscured nationalist, develop, nationalist developments within the Soviet state. Many Students of uh, Ron developed these ideas. One of Ron's student, students, Terry Martin, developed this approach in his book, Affirmative Action Empire, now also a classical study of the Soviet Union. As Ron has shown, the emergence of mass nationalist popular movement that repeatedly unfolded in the era of, uh, uh, I'm sorry, that rapidly unfolded in the era of Gorbachev's reforms, profoundly contributed to the collapse of the Soviet Union. And the dynamic 
this dynamic explains to us the title of Ron's book, those national movements that Lenin helped to develop, they were the revenge of the past in 1991. I should say that the impact of this pioneering critical approach to the Soviet nationality policy goes beyond studies of the Soviet era only. For students of the 19th century like myself, this new approach has served as an impetus for uncovering some embryonic expressions of ethnic tolerance in the imperial time as well. So it's not only the Bolsheviks who um, began that, and Ron alludes to that in, not alludes, actually expl ex explains this in the revenge of the past, but in the most recent um, research, uh, these ideas were expanded and developed. The revenge of the past beautifully examines how Russia's imperial regime, which tried to impose a uniform way of life, was nevertheless extraordinarily tolerant of differences. This line of thinking has been productively de developed in 19th century scholarship, uh, which shows that the Russian Empire was a particularistic empire that of often maintained or even produced differences among it its constitu constituents instead of erasing uh, differences. And Bell and Ron developed these ideas in their Russia's empires. One more point, the range of the past explores the relationship between the formation of class and the formation of nationality and interprets it as historically con contingent occur occurrences um, that were socially and discursively constituted. This approach was particularly revealing and appealing to me as a someone who under the Soviet regime was forced to study classical or dogmatic Marxism. And of course, I didn't like it. <laughs> for me and for many Russian scholars, it was an eye-opening arg argument that the political claims of classes and ethnicities are the, spe uh, the specific products of the historically shaped discourses of the 19th century and the, and the 20th century. And at this point, when I realized that, I began to write my book about nationalism in the 19th century. But regardless of my own perspective, this was a fundamental breakthrough. The book has recovered a dramatic story of the uneven evolution of ethnic communities into nationalities in the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union, and the complex and overlapping relationship between nationality formation and class formation in the Russian Empire. The book has shown how socialist and nationalist agendas competed, under, uh, intermingled, supported, or undermined one another in different corners of empire. Transcaucasia, the Baltic states, Ukraine, and Belarus, and Finland. Uh, Ron's focus on the relationship between the social and the ethnic made it possible to offer a more coherent understanding of the Russian Revolution and of Russia as a multinational state. And I think that in Ron's article, Nationalism Constructed, Constructing Primordialism, um, the, the article that was published in 2001, uh, the major ideas of the revenge of the past were developed. Uh, Ron employed uh, the notion of imagined, invented, uh, or constructed community, uh, continued to employ it in the article as well, as well to historicize the problem of nationality formation. Uh, in the paper, Ron continues this constructivist approach and expands it into the discussion of identity theory. And that's what I appreciate the most uh, in, in this article. I was really, uh, I was thinking about the famous Blue Baker and Cooper article about uh, I, um, the issue of identity. And, uh, 
around your advocacy of identity theory uh, emphasizes the historical and contextual generation of categories of self-understanding. And this is why your invitation not to get rid, not to dismiss identity uh, theory and that identity concept uh, really appealed uh, to me. In both cases, in the book and in the paper, human agency remains central to the production of nationality and identity. And in both the book and the paper, Ron mercifully demonstrates profound advantages of the turn to, uh, toward constructivism for understanding imperial Soviet and post-Soviet Russia. And the concluding remark, I should say that as a literary historian, I enjoy, uh, literary scholar, I enjoy Ron's style and the metaphors that are there. It's, it's a pleasure, it's a real true pleasure to read you. Thank you. Ron, do you want to join us on stage? Is that the format of the question and answer? Yes. Okay, yeah. Yes, please. Uh, so for, um, Ron mentioned last night that um, uh, it used to be a big point of his in teaching to undergrads to teach them that the nation was constructed, and now he doesn't have to do it anymore because they come in already knowing that. Um, and so I'm wondering what is now the problem, the challenges in teaching about nations and nationalism uh, to students that uh, you all find in, in teaching? Well, my students think that everything that I say, say is a kind of um, authentic Russian knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> and when I tell them that it's uh, Professor Suni who works in our university who in, in, uh, inaugurated these discussions, they go to S Professor Suni to take his classes. <laughs> the major problem today uh, is not so much about the constructivism of nations. If they don't know it, we should teach that. Because if nations are primordial, real, objective, ancient, organic, fixed, harmonious within, different outside, and all the rest, then living together is very difficult. And I remember uh, Rennie mentioned the CIA, going to the CIA. Uh, people, by the way, who have no sense of humor at all. Uh, and <laughs> I started my first my first sentence there, I said, well, the Cold War must be over if the CIA invites a Marxist to come and tell them about the Soviet Union. Nobody laughed. <laughs> so, so don't make a joke in, 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 Lang in, Lang in Langley. But um, so you, if, if you do accept the constructivist analysis, and remember, d constructivism doesn't mean that it's possible to deconstruct nations because they're products of history and of feeling, and deep feelings, and experience. The only thing you can hope for is that under certain conditions, they might be able to reconstruct themselves. They may be able to think differently about their discourses, their dominant ways of seeing themselves in the other. And that's what Muguet and I were trying to do with Watts, which was start a dialogue, and it was relatively successful, okay, among certain intellectuals, Kurdish, uh, Kurds recognize the genocide, so that's not a problem uh, officially. And, but, but among Turks, um, among Armenians, and so forth. And there was, to a certain degree, success. That's, we're backsliding now. Uh, those conferences can't be held any longer in Turkey, and so forth. So uh, that's what you would say. Now, so what is the main problem? Today, I would say the main problem, it's an intellectual, political problem, is finding balance because everything is against balance. It's against thinking, well, why did the Turks carry out a genocide? Is this simply the Turkish, the terrible Turk, and therefore essentially these are Armenian killers? Or are there ways we can understand why they have these feelings? Why do Turks today have this existential uh, threat feeling against the Kurds, who they think present a problem to the further existence of their Kemalist state? Those kinds of things. Uh, so balance is important. We're in a moment now with the, the, uh, with the invasion of, of uh, Ukraine in which balance is becoming very difficult, right? Um, Jean Viev yesterday in the forum we did, uh, someone said we have to protect 
Ukrainian students. And Jean Viev very intelligently said, we also have to protect our Russian students, which is harder to do because this is not a, a, a war that's even. One side is clearly the victim of, of the other. Um, but if you're going to think of the future, and I'm always, I'm a leftist, I'm a utopian in some ways. I believe you can solve human problems, uh, not through war. Uh, then you have to sort of think about how the Azeri Armenian discourses can be shifted. It's very difficult. It's more difficult in 2022 than it would have been earlier before the war uh, of the fall of 2020, or how Turks, Kurds, and Armenians can begin to see each other. And I'm afraid we're in for a long haul between Ukrainians and Russians. It's not in the cards for a while. Probably I won't live to, to see that. Nations, if there's one thing about nations, is they all seem to feel they're in danger. Even the United States. How many times you hear, oh, we're so divided, oh, we're polarized, oh, this or that. And very, this is a part of a big, strong right-wing discourse about the loss of the identity of certain parts of our population who feel threatened by what? By modernity, <laughs> by modern times, by mobility, by the rise of other groups who are underprivileged, like, like people of color, women, uh, et cetera, who now are finding a place. So uh, Russia is a nation that lives with its own victimhood. That's, their that's the one of the, what is the dominant motion, emotion in Russia? We're humiliated. We, we have been discriminated against. Uh, people are pushing us uh, down, et cetera. Those are dangerous, dangerous emotions. In a very funny way, if I had to make a very um, immediate generalization, I would say that Ukraine is far more uh, a nation and far more cohesive, coherent, and conscious of a nation at this time than Russians are. Russians are going to undergo a very serious questioning of the nature of their nationhood. They've always been doing that. They're always confused about it. It's only going to get, get worse. Uh, okay, we can take questions from the audience. And as a reminder to people on Zoom, they can put questions in the uh, Q&A. Uh, There's a mic behind you. Thank you so much uh, for a wonderful presentation. Um, uh, and when the issue of identity comes up, uh, I want to just reflect on how I perceived what the history department was going through and what Ron sort of was uh, like there uh, from 1988 onwards when we started working together. And I think uh, what was very important uh, uh, to me in, in seeing it is what this, this sort of is triggered by what uh, Jeff Ely said before by putting uh, Ron in the same category with Rosenberg and that was not the same uh, in my uh, view because I think in this context uh, uh, always coming from a sort of a minority standpoint uh, Ron's identity as an Armenian within both the Soviet Union and Russia and the United States and mainstream historical discourse in the United States made a big difference because I could still remember uh, the tension with Rosenberg sort of seeing uh, Russia en masse or the Soviet Union en masse and Ron trying to sort of bring, come from the periphery almost uh, to challenge that. So I think that I wanted to see if uh, he could comment on, on uh, his standpoint and how that is critical standpoint and how that developed, I think, out of his own identity. Thank you. I think uh, the struggle was how to make, and we talked about this to some extent last night, and Melanie will feel this, you know, right to the, her bones. How can we make Armenian studies, because we are a small people, beleaguered people, uh, unknown people, uh, how can we make that central to some larger discussions, right? By um, comparative histories, by um, theoretical approaches, by bringing Armenian studies into the mainstream. And at, at the least at the University of Michigan, that's been relatively successful. Um, Russianists, and Brian will appreciate this, and East Europeanists always have to deal with the fact that we are marginalized, that we're second. We have to learn the histories of the French Revolution, of the Tudor era, uh, of the German Reichs, 
but they don't necessarily have to learn about Ivan the Terrible or, or, or Nicholas II or whatever. So we have a kind of double or triple burden is that Armenian studies has to learn about Russian history, Ottoman history, Persian history, but also about uh, Western European, et cetera. Um, and someone mentioned this this morning, maybe it was Jeff, I can't remember, uh, that we, we learned from more well-funded and larger historiographies like that of Great Britain, the, Lewis mentioned uh, E.P. Thompson and Hobsbawm and so forth, um, and hopefully they also may learn from us. I think the best book written on empires was written at the University of Michigan by Val Kevelson and me. <laughs> and it is a book about Russia because the people were not even discussing Russia. Jane Burbank, this to a large extent, but in the comparative histories of, of empires. They were limiting empires to overseas empires, uh, you know, and we had a lot of post-colonial scholars who were working on various aspects. And our book tried to say, look, we have serious questions here about when a nation is made, what an empire is, how the two intersect, and so forth. Um, and I think eventually, Val, that book will have a kind of generative effect, but we'll be patient. Is that a question in the in the Q and A there, or? It's a question that I think we're gonna leave to the very last. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good one, uh, but Val up here, Val. I think. Thank you. Uh, thanks for this. This is a really great panel. Um, I guess I had a couple of questions, mostly generated by Rennie's question about if it's not construction of nation, then, then what's the key question? And uh, like Krista, I think in my experience, the kind of Cold War legacy um, is still a real motivating factor in teaching that I, I taught a course on Russian witchcraft last semester. And at the end of it, um, one of the students said, I think the point is, Russia isn't as weird as we think. <laughs> so I took that as a success. Um, but now I'm wondering, of course, and I'm wondering what's going to happen with this, the Cold War residue today. So that was one sort of open-ended question. Um, and the other was off of Ron's point that all nations considered themselves beleaguered or under threat. And I'm glad Jeff came in because I was wondering, what about the British sort of at the high point of empire? Was there a different affective lay of the land? Uh, I was just trying to, trying to think of exceptions. And that's the one that, that sort of floated to mind. Uh, the mic. Thank you for a very good panel. <laughs> I wanted to ask Olga, you said something that uh, grabbed my interest since I often interview people about what made a difference to them in their past. And you said that when you read Ron's book in, and you were still in Russia, that it was an eye opener for you. And I wonder if you could say something about what you thought before and how it opened your eyes. Uh, we were not introduced to this idea of to this constructivist approach um, before uh, Ron's book. It was the first book that reached our, us, the Russian scholars. And I lived in Moscow. I believe that I'm, very, I'm a representative of the general um, things that they were going uh, there. If uh, such ideas were not familiar to us in Moscow, more kind of privileged people with libraries uh, around. Uh, so um, most likely they were not uh, popular or familiar in other parts of, of the former Soviet Union. Uh, so first of all, it was very hard to believe that uh, people who subscribe to the constructivist approach, they consider themselves Marxists. 
because we understood Marxism as, a, as something uh, completely different. Um, so it took me years to reconcile, to understand why Ron, uh, writing such things, calls him, himself Marxist. Um, but, but I should say that we, we, we are completely convinced, and I'm talking about a group of uh, young scholars uh, in the 90s in Russia at that time. Unfortunately, all of us left Russia. Uh, ultimately. But um, what I'm trying to say that we were fascinated by this, by this constructivist approach and began to write our books about, uh, about that. It appealed to us. It immediately, maybe because of uh, quite developed uh, cultural studies in uh, Russia by that time, but it, it was very appealing. Can I add to that? It's a moment. So, um, of course, I am not the originator of either constructivism or construction of the nation. I, did, I didn't mean it. No, no, I, I understand. That you, no, but I, I think I was a translator. I tried to bring it into Soviet studies because exactly. where was Soviet studies or where was the popular discourse about nationalism in the Soviet Union? Soviet Union was russifying, totalitarian, nationalities had no voice, um, and uh, there was a kind of effort to, to erase nationality altogether. And then I went there and I saw, wait a minute, what's going on in Georgia and Armenia? This is more national than, than I've ever imagined before. And one had to figure out why that was, was happening. And you found Lenin actually had a different approach. There was this policy of indigenization, colonizatia, and so forth. So that was important. But there was, Olga, maybe you will remember this. There was a pernicious after effect of this approach. So I, I was presenting this constructive thing. I went to anthropological congresses in Russia and gave keynote addresses and things like that. And there was a fellow there, very important, Valery Tishkov. And Valery Tishkov was close to the administration of, of Yeltsin. This is our early 90s, right, and after. Uh, and Valery Tishkov, uh, head of the Institute of Ethnology and Ethnography in Moscow Academy of Sciences, was also the first minister of nationalities since the last minister, <laughs> Stalin, in the oh 20s. <laughs> he was Stalin's not immediate successor. <laughs> and what was Tishkov's view? He took this idea, of, he's a friend of mine, took this idea of constructive and said, we can get rid of these nationalities. <laughs> we can deconstruct them. So you could also become enemy of the people by, by, by discussing this. Uh, and I'm wondering now, how pernicious and pervasive is Putin's idea that he can, that he can define Ukraine out of existence as a nation, right? Now, the argument of, of, of a lot of our work and of constructiveness is, is that a nation, which we think is a relatively modern concept in its current discursive formation, is when a group of people who think, imagine, believe, they share a culture, believe also that because of that culture, they have the right to political self-determination, perhaps a state of their own, and a piece of the world's real estate, namely the homeland, right? Ukrainians certainly feel that. Now, part of that occurred on a mass level, not from the group of 19th century nationalists who wrote in Ukrainian, but under the Soviets. That's a part of history that's also been erased, right? Because Soviet Union is seen as, as an alien, alien to this national development. But it was under the Soviets, under Koronizatsia uh, and so forth, that Ukrainians, a process of Ukrainianization took place, along with the destruction of the nation, the Holodomor, the mass death famine of the 1930s, persecution and even murder of Ukrainian intellectuals, the war which then Ukrainians, more Ukrainians identified ultimately with the Soviets against the Nazis, not at the beginning, but later. And then the post-Stalin period of, of conflict, tension between nationalizing tendencies, uh, the shellist period and so forth, and denationalizing de de tendencies. So it's a complicated picture, but can anyone really honestly say that Ukrainians today, even before the invasion, didn't have a sense that they were not only a nation, but a nation with a state and 
a, a, a clear idea of their own history, uh, and by the way, central to Ukrainian nationalism, sadly, is that Russians are our eternal enemy, right? So they have an Armenian-like toward the Turks uh, uh, nationalism. And Russians, insofar as the real right-wing Russians have a sense of their own nation, it's that Ukraine is part of us. They have an imperial vision of, of Ukraine as little Russians who belong somehow in some union with us. So this is a, this is a real dilemma that is gonna be hard to you know, reconstruct or deconstruct. I, I will add a, a couple of words. Uh, Putin explicitly said that uh, he learned this lesson about construct, uh, con construction of uh, nations, and he explicitly said that uh, there is no Ukrainian nation. There is the Ukraine named after Lenin, meaning that Lenin made it. Um, and uh, um, we decommunize. De decommunize it so the communists created it and we will decommunize it so deconstruct Me meaning we will deconstruct it yeah. you want, do you want to say something about britain and their endangered sense of nation val invoked you earlier about this in her comment Oh, I see. So Ron was talking about the the affective dispositions of of national nation formation, and he said that nations tend to feel embattled and endangered and beleaguered, and that that's part of. Am I am I misstating? Um, so I was just kind of running through in my head, is that always the case? Can we think of instances where we'd see a different pattern, a more triumphalist pattern? And I thought of Britain. No, nation. So, um, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I, I'd have to have have more more of a thick context for 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 the, for the question. I mean, Britain has never, you know, the, the the I should say the English, the English have never transcended the loss of empire. Of course, they feel beleaguered. I mean, you only have to think of, you know. Uh, you know, the separating sore of, you know, anti-immigration from the 1960s. I meant during the period of empire, though. Oh, sorry. Well, I think... Never mind. Yeah. I don't mean to put you on the spot here. Well, I think, clearly, you know, clearly in, in, in the late 19th century and early 20th century, I think the British, like the French, and the Germans and the US have an, inc an extraordinarily powerful in sense of imperial mission, and that and that in 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 a in a in a global economy defined by the rivalry, the rivalries of world empires. There's the you know there was a a kind of simultaneity of of um, of anxiety and triumphalism, you know. But I don't think that's only British. I think that's a that's that's the common that's a common um, syndrome of of imperial uh, expansion, where you know it's on the one hand it's a matter of life and death, like you know conditions of of survival in this rivalrous world economy is the possession of an empire. And of course, the, the British were very successful at acquiring it in the 19th century. And it's also, it's, it's the dialectics of, of prosperity and survival. And so it, it, it obviously it has all sorts of anxieties built into it around, around uh, racialized conceptions of, 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 of national, imperial, 
identity, uh, but it's also incredibly triumphalist, you know, as, as we know, you know, especially in the period of, uh, of high imperialism, you know, from the 1880s. And, uh, you know, those that don't have it want it. And to the degree that they have access, then there's the same kind of triumphalism like Germany or Italy. Germany and Italy. Is that right? <clears throat> the beginnings of a NASA. Um, okay, well, thank you all for this wonderful panel. I think we're just a little over. Uh, we can all look forward. Any lingering questions can be answered in Ron's forthcoming book, um, the, the Long Duree History of the Nation. Is there a title yet, Ron? The title is Forging the Nation, the Making and Faking of Nationalisms. And that will be the final word on the topic. <laughs> okay, thank you all. <laughs>